Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. Neil Winteray with Matterhorn Business Development here. If you are new to the channel, please give us a like and a thumbs up on the video because we have a lot of very cool stuff coming and I don't want you to miss any of it. Some of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about on the channel has to do with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial spirit. And in light of that, I have with me Natalie Nagengast. She is the founder of Markets for Makers. And uh, she has quite a story and she has learned a lot working with small businesses. And as a result, she wanted to share some of this knowledge with you to help you with your business and to help other people do better. So Natalie, welcome. Hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, thank you for coming on. Absolutely. You are a guest I've wanted to have for a couple of months now. It's amazing. Yes, <laughs> well, for those of you who might have been following the channel, I did a video a couple months ago about Sears going under, and I mentioned that there used to be a market uh, downtown here that everybody used to come to on the weekends and how I thought putting a market into these giant retailers that are going under these wide open spaces would be a fantastic thing to do for these open spaces. Then I talked about how go-kart tracks would probably be better, but since that's not real, we're gonna talk about markets. Let's coordinate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to coordinate. Let's to coordinate for, uh, for markets to be able to move in. Yeah. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about um, you, how you got into the markets uh, as an industry and what it yeah. is that you do because you've run into, I mean, this is the really the essence of being an entrepreneur, a mm -hmm. little bit of your story. It was ups and downs and now it's just exploding and going like crazy and it still yeah. has its ups and downs, oh, I know, yeah. right? Oh, absolutely. But why don't you tell yeah. us a little bit about like what yeah, made yeah. you get into opening a market and starting in this? So, okay, so it started with me working at a marketing company and when I left, I wanted to learn more about social media. So I decided to start my own maker company and try to pick an item that I could test all the social media okay. strategies on. And so- Kind of like uh, an, an Etsy type product or like well, a- Well, yeah, I picked jewelry because it was the smallest thing that I could easily ship. And so I looked at having candles and I thought about the mess it would make and all these different options that you have. And so I started this, this company and I was getting into markets all around the Tampa Bay area and we're located in Clearwater. So it would be about a 45 minute drive every time we'd go, maybe an hour, have to get up early. And I was volunteering at the time with a nonprofit and they said, well, well we wanna do you know, our drug education in the community, we wanna be able to get out information. And so I actually started a market. And so we checked out a few different lots and one of the hardest things whenever you're starting a market is permitting. Yeah. So we found a lot that was owned by a, a nonprofit, but then you can't sell anything. So we were, we were looking around for a while and we found this beautiful location right outside uh, my door on Pier Street, and it's right on the water. We called it Pier Street Market, and it's under a big bridge, it was gorgeous. And so we put all sorts of food items, but I also wanted to be able to have different types of makers. And so a maker would be anyone that has something handmade. And so we started Pier Street Market wow. that way. Yeah, so there's basically, a longer story, but yeah. No, well, <laughs> yeah. I like it because um, I did something similar where I wanted to find business networking yeah. and I couldn't find a good business networking group. And so I got tired of the normal business networking groups. Yeah. And so I decided I'm just gonna start my own. Exactly. And that's kind of what you were like. You're like, well, I could go to Tampa and I could do all this, but yeah. we don't, we need something like that locally. So why doesn't somebody do it? And so you just exactly. sort of. Exactly, well, it was funny because it, it had exploded when we started it. I mean, I didn't expect too much out of it, but I know that whenever you're starting a new endeavor, the biggest thing you have to work on is marketing. And you have to think with what is it gonna take to become um, huge very quickly? Because otherwise right. you have got this time, you're running against time and money and all of those things. So I remember learning from one, uh, he did, what did he do? He was a, a a personal finance advisor okay. and normally they say to get into personal finance because that was an area I was looking at getting into because my background is in finance I, I said you know how did you jump start so quickly and they say it normally takes five to ten years until you're making good money well I knew someone that instead of doing a small marketing campaign he sent out 10,000 or 100,000 different types of promotional material out into his community and he was able to jumpstart within a year of where another guy would be able to get started. Most people within. would be taking it very slow, five years, 10 years. It's about relationships. So you gotta yeah. get yourself out there as quick as possible. You have to be able to reach a large number of people that, to introduce yourself to as quick as humanly possible and gain relationships. Right. And so I basically uh, was able to start it and I was able to fund extra marketing because when I had started it, I didn't wanna come to the city and say, hey, I have this great plan. I wanted to start 
start it first, come back to them and say, hey, look what I've already built. Let's go ahead and pour money into it. And so I had applied for a small grant from the city and they, they granted it to me and it went 100% into marketing. So wow. we were able to do a monthly market at first and then it was a bi-monthly market by, you know, we started in October, November, December, by January, we were doing it twice a month. And I so, remember that. Yeah, so it was very quick to ramp up. How many vendors did you guys get up to? You know, our opening was around 60, and then that was the hard, it's so hard to start the first one, because you have to convince 60 people that you're going to be successful. That is going to be worth it, yeah. Yeah, and you're charging them, <laughs> and they're like, is this even going to be worth it? So, um, so you have 60, we had 60 to start, we were pretty steady at 80, and then by the time uh, that we kind of hit peak, it was anywhere from 100 to 110 different makers, food trucks, just random, you know, people that would be in the market. Yeah. And so it and was some of them great. were really big. I remember one of the last ones I went to, because I travel yeah. all the time, and I would always be mad when I was out of town oh, during the weekend yeah. that the market was going on, so yeah. I missed a lot of them. But but one of them was like this massive tent with like, I don't know, 40, 50 different vegetables and fruits. Oh, I and love like, the vegetables, yeah. It was just like massive. Well, half of, I always thought I was gonna start a farmer's market, and yeah. out of necessity, I had to go towards like more of a maker's market, which is more handmade. And so it was because I couldn't find any farmers in Clearwater. I mean, if you look in the Pinellas, right. Tampa Bay area, the amount of farmland is, there's none. Like you have to be about You go an, an hour, hour or two away, you're good. But yeah, inside of this area, Exactly, and getting them limited. to drive all the way into Clearwater. So yeah. some of the tents, the people that bring tents, they drive up all the way from Naples. Wow. And so we never, we never called ourselves a farmer's market. We would right. call ourselves, uh, you know, a maker's market or just a street market. There was a lot of, there's a lot of ways. It was a broad, it. it was a broad, uh, terms that yeah. you could put a variety of things into it. Well, I didn't just think produce. I tried to think with, okay, honeys and all sorts of different items. So, you know, I, I surveyed, well, it's interesting. I didn't necessarily even survey. I mean, I'd survey my makers, but I could tell, you can always tell the person that is making great sales by the time the, the market is over. You walk through the market, you see who has barely any honey left on their table or the product on their table, and you ask them, how did it go? And, you know, most of the time, if someone said it didn't go so well, you know that when you're bringing a lot of people in, you yeah. know that it's not you, and you know that there's probably something that they need to tweak within their own company on pricing, packaging, the product itself. So the by way proxy, did you end up having to kind of, to keep them happy, because they are your customers too, the vendors, did you kind of start diving in a little bit with some of them and trying to help them, or was sometimes, it were they a little bit more hands off? It's hard sometimes to tell somebody their baby is ugly, you know, and yeah. so it's just one of those Actually, things. I find it quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you, you have to be really careful because they get really defensive yeah. very quickly. So you have to find, you have to wait for them to ask you like, so what do you think about my baby? And you're like, well, you know, it's yeah. cute, but um, you know, there's different ways that you can improve, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and it was interesting though, because I did find that like depending on my attendance of the market, even today, I will have decent attendance and all of my good makers will do great no matter what. But right. those people that don't have the best products, they all, they will struggle. But if I bring in a certain amount over three, 4,000 people throughout the weekend, no matter, okay. no matter if their products are terrible, somebody's going to pity them and, and buy something, you right. know? And, um, but a lot of it has to do with their attitude. I mean, we'll have a lot of jewelry and one person will, it's so interesting to see how they treat their businesses. One person will stand behind and they'll say hi to every single person. Other people will sit in a chair and they wait for people to come up to their products and ask them yeah. how much it costs. I have other people that won't even stand behind the table. They will get out in the aisle way and- uh, And those are the people who do the best. Oh my gosh, they sell it so much. Um, I have these guys, I love them, the two guys company out of Miami and they will, go up to every single person and, and try to get them to try their lotion and, you know, rub it in. And yeah. then, they'll, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Aesop. Have you ever been to Aesop? No. Aesop is uh, a new, they have hair care and, and lotions and yeah, things. Yeah, and I've seen it. I've just... They're around. They're in, yeah. in, in they're Tampa. Big, right? They're in, yeah. They're like Warby Parker. Okay. They're out of Australia. But they'll be, the, they don't just give you lotion. They'll like take your hand and rub it in uncomfortably. Yeah, see, that's as very you're, uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. And tell you all about it while they're holding your hand. Like, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a certain point where it's a little too much in your space. Uh, yeah. Two guys don't do that. Yeah. But they will, you know, they'll give you a little hand massage, I guess, if you want it. But, but they're very, they very much talk to everyone. They create relationships. So the second time they come back, they do better. Third time they come back, they do better and better and better. And they don't, there's certain companies like that that are actually 
actually creating relationships where the person's already bought it and they want to come back again and get more. Yeah. So. And I think that that's very important for any, that example yeah. fits in line with what I talk about all the time with retail is that stores are struggling to survive because for so long they had so many people coming in. Yeah. They were always going to make money just because they had the volume and it didn't matter if on average each person only bought a certain amount because yeah. they had so many people coming in didn't matter but now that that traffic has died down to malls yeah. and things they haven't changed no they haven't changed their customer service in fact customer service has gotten worse yeah which means the more body anyway that i find well, that very interesting that that's yeah that's I mean, what you find out the market as well up, yeah you bring up an interesting point you the the, the history of retail is mom and pops yep. and then came in the malls and then came in amazon and i feel like there's this evolution going back to mom and pops absolutely because everyone has the same thing. Now, it depends on the city too, because what, I, what I'm trying to do with my markets at this point is you've, what I, it's what I call cookie cutter cities. Mm -hmm. And so in America, everybody is being fed what they should want and eat and wear with, with, within the city. So I grew up in a small city that has about 50,000 people in Indiana. And in Indiana, it's literally as if they cookie cuttered every single city. So every city has a Target, an Olive Garden, a Panera, a Starbucks, uh, you know, Chipotle. I mean, they literally, it's not, there's no You mom can and drive pops by a, a mall and kind of know what's in it already. Exactly. A lot of times. Exactly. Like franchising has changed everything. And so my idea with the market wasn't just to, wasn't just to like, try to encourage shopping local, but to try to create a balance. You know, yeah, you do go get a, you know, really cheap necklace that's about $3 at Forever 21. Well, you might buy something from a maker that's $50, that's another, you know, a necklace, but you should try to balance. You should try to shop small as much as possible because- And I agree with you, it is starting yeah. to come back. It's, and Amazon's yeah. always going to be there, and I think the people that are getting the squeeze is the malls and the retailers. Oh, I think Amazon's going to get bigger and bigger. I think if you look in the future, it's not going to be a whole lot going out. I mean, so much today is about experiences and what you can Instagram. So if you're going to go shop, it's one of the reasons why I love my markets is, is we'll get in more into this, but, yeah. um, but I, I now work more towards experience-driven retail, experience-driven anything. If you look at what is growing right now, it is experiences. If you look at even Halloween, when I was a kid or my mom was a kid, my mom says there wasn't even any decorations really. I mean, some people like one house on the block would decorate. Nowadays, everybody loves Halloween. I mean, right. Valentine's Day is pushed as a huge major holiday that it didn't is. used to be a big, you know, you hand make a card before. Um, then the you know chocolate and flower company jumped yeah. on you know and they push Hallmark. it and they, yeah. well and they they market it so every woman feels like they need chocolates and flowers to feel special on this special day you know and so yeah. there's a lot more marketing that's mass marketing that makes people feel like okay Christmas um, there's a lot more Christmas parks that are going to be starting to pop up and you're going to see that as well just like Halloween uh, you didn't used but to have as many haunted houses go ahead there's a lot of mom and pop type Halloween experiences that have popped up. Yeah. Some have even ended up on Shark Tank and our national things now. Oh, absolutely. But yeah, those experience-driven things are, are big. Exactly. I mean, apps is one thing that's getting big, of course, but experiences is something that I would invest so much money into if it's done properly, you know? Yeah. And there's definitely the good way to do it and the bad way to do it. But I did come from a, my background, my, my family, my brother, he owns haunted houses. Yes. So I was already used to learning about experiences. So it was really great because he was able to give me a lot of insights on how to market uh, certain things. And yeah. I actually tell him more now these days. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because you're him. out and about and doing all these different things. I test a lot of stuff. Yeah. I know, you know, that's the biggest thing is you gotta go out there, you gotta test a lot of things because every company is different. Now, uh, nowadays, we're gonna kind of just retail or go back to what we yeah. were talking about with the market. We went off into a few different areas, but um, you, I mean, you got this market right here on Pierce Street. It was yeah. booming. All of a sudden, it yeah. kind of, had a problem no yeah it was a there problem. was a problem and now yeah you can tell us about the problem in a second, yeah, but yeah. now you've got what, five markets going in multiple yeah, states it, it so was, what happened yeah and then kind of like you hit the adversity that an entrepreneur runs into and you have the idea to either hey i can give up or i can keep pushing yeah and why don't you tell us a little bit about that okay so we were rolling with the market in clearwater and Basically what happened was is the market went out for an official RFP, which is a request for proposals. So what happens is is the city decided that uh, you know some other people wanted to see if they could put their market where our market had been and and they decided that they wanted to put the market out for a 
for bids. And mm. once I got the bid back, I saw that they needed me to give over my entire vendor list. I also needed to, um, at any point in time, they could select what was going to be in my market, as well as if they didn't feel like I was I was adequate or I didn't follow the rules or whatever it might be, um, they could take over ownership of my company. And so I, at so first- So basically it was going from like this yeah. private thing that you started to basically the city's going to get involved, yeah. put out bids. It was, yeah. it was becoming interesting. Yeah, it became interesting and I, you know, it was really a shock to me when it happened. And at this point, it was the best thing that had ever happened to me. Um, at the time, you think, oh my gosh, this is the end. What am I gonna do? I mean, it, it, they had put it on the table in a way that felt like they wanted to own it. And so I saw this this one line that said, that, oh, they, the company had to be in business for two years. And I said, oh, well, I've been in business only a year and a half. So I just won't even reply and I haven't, I'll just tell them it wasn't They changed old the rules of the game up. Well, later they, they changed it and I was ruffling some feathers. I mean, <laughs> by not replying, but, um, I didn't want to, sometimes with your own business, you don't always want to play by another person's rules. For so sure. you want to, in your business, try to maintain as much of your own ability to make the calls. So whenever I took sponsorship money or anything, I had to realize you have to answer up to someone. And as soon as I am playing by their rules and I'm signing certain contracts, I had to go through and, and I finally compiled a, a large document for them. And I did put my bid in, which we then lost. And I kind of knew that was going to happen anyways when they had put the whole market out for a bit. I just thought they wouldn't do that unless they wanted to take over ownership. And they thought it was right. easy. People think a lot of, when well, you make something look like easy. You yeah. lost the market yeah. and there's never been one back. Well, they, they sold it. They were going to try to make profit off of it. And they sold it to a lady out of Orlando. And so she took it over. First market had 40 makers and then it just went down from there. But right. that's not really the point. I mean, the point was, is that it got me to this point where I thought, do I, Cut my losses. I mean, you lo I lost at that point, you know, over fifty thousand dollars when that had happened because we had invested so much the first two years. We thought, okay, third year, here we go. We're gonna this make money. This is the profit time. This is the moment. Yeah. You know, like you put <laughs> we so built the much foundation. Money in. Oh yeah. Now we're gonna make money. We put so much money in, so let's do it. Okay. And so I got to that point, and I thought, do I end here? And I looked at it, and I, I helped. I helped. I wouldn't say thousands because we had thousands. We had like over 5,000 makers or something throughout the markets that I had, I had done. Or in the two-year like period? I think it was like 3,400 actually. I want to say it felt like that's 5, amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. And we had put so much money back into the community. We had so many people that said, "Now you just can't stop. I've got this bee company. You know, we got this honey. We got this, this different items." And so um, that happened in October when we lost it. So in November, I threw a big holiday market in Tampa, and I thought I was crazy because I was going to charge to get into a building. I was going to rent the building. I was going to charge to get in. And I had seen another lady do it out of LA, which um, her, her company is Unique Markets out of Los Angeles. And so she'll get these cool venues and she'll charge to come to shop. And so most people are like, why do I have to pay to get in? A you cover know? charge to why? shop. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, what, what's up with this? So yeah. anyways, um, I just thought I'd try it. And anyways, the we had the first market and we profited. And I thought, well, people came out. They Most most of my vendors, I, all the time, people say they have their highest ever sales at our markets. And that was one of those where we just knocked it out of the park. So I came back and regrouped in January. And I thought, well, let's go ahead. And we had rented a, a warehouse in Tampa at that time. So yeah. it was, it already been rented out to someone else by the beginning of the year. And so we decided, okay, let's let's expand. Where can we go? And so I mainly looked at cities that had beautiful venues that were big enough for our company. And so that was Miami. Jacksonville was the first one I found. Gorgeous venue there. Uh, we looked into Nashville. I'm from Indianapolis, so I thought that was perfect in my yep. hometown. And so we launched four cities last year. It was a big investment last year. I mean, I'd love to say that, you know, that we are debt free at this point. We're huge and we've exploded, but it's amazing. We've, we have grown and we'll do what we did in one weekend, what we did for the entire year of Pier Street Market. And so wow. it's amazing and it's so much less work. It's so much more condensed. And it took me to that next level that had I quit at that time, I think I would have been really kicking myself. And, and I'm really happy that we've continued to grow. So now this year we're launching Chicago in a couple of weeks. Wow. So we'll have five cities. We're looking so at more. So it'll be five cities with Chicago. Yep. And um, a lot of times it's, hey, where's the venue? Where can I get a good deal on a good venue? Because, you know, makers, they can't be charged $2,000 a space like you can in trade show. Trade shows are two, four, or $5,000 booths. Right. And that's not what we're about. So 
so we still try to keep it affordable for them. That's amazing. Yeah, so it's been going great. Um, our first launch was in Jacksonville, and it went great. And we started and we went to Miami, and we found in Miami because the venue is in the Miami Design District. And we were seeing 3,000 people come to what you've been talking about, retail. So this is the Miami Design District has Gucci, Dior. I mean, they have all these different places I've yeah. never even heard of. Yeah. But what I loved about the neighborhood was they have these great restaurants as well that were all, all local. Yeah. And they're all very well thought out. A lot of them, you know, are are to Miami, but they're beautiful restaurants. And so we bring three thousand people in, and it's this gorgeous four-story building that has this beautiful sculpture in the middle, and you kind of go around like this uh, up. The, up yeah. the market and so when someone's done they're really hungry we don't necessarily keep food at that market because we want them to go out into the neighborhoods and the neighborhood saw such a peak in sales and in people coming around and we nowadays with with your admission we give everyone a tote bag and a free flower crown so it's a whole experience <laughs> and so anyways so they feel like they actually get something yeah. coming in the door for, so, their, for their entry fee or whatever oh yeah, yeah. but it's great because in the neighborhood everyone's walking around with flower crowns and tote bags and you're like where where'd you get your flower crown why is everybody yeah. walking around and you know it creates a buzz see, i think that local vibe is what people yeah. want and i think that's why i yes. say retail is not dead it's just that they're it's so different they're so stuck in a box i also think that so much of it has to do with aesthetics i mm -hmm. will never put a market into a hotel that has carpeting i don't like carpeting first of all yeah um i will never you have to you have to reinvent your location so they're aesthetic they bring in natural light like nobody wants to be under fluorescence anymore mm -hmm. and they want that natural light when they come in or they i look for specific things in my venues and it's funny when we've ever struggled in a venue it's usually because we didn't have the nice enough or didn't have enough air conditioning or whatever we've run into that a few times yeah. where it just happens to go out the day of the 90 degree uh, heat you know and yeah. we're in a certain city so anyways but um but yeah i mean uh retail i think what it needs to do is you need to have experience driven complexes one of my favorite complexes is in tampa called armature works i love armature works yeah it has it's a multi-use space so you've got it's co -work, got everything in it it's got co-work it's got uh different types of event spaces and it has food halls and it has venues and so if there's one thing that i would like to do in the future it's to create a space like that and try to help different cities as well as retail developments try to get this concept where even at the international mall in in tampa they built this whole new area that's outside, that's outside. Area. yeah and so it's just a different type of vibe you don't see these indoor malls unless they're up north i mean yeah you i just went up to chicago recently and you are so thankful for the indoor malls i yes. mean you just want to get inside <laughs> that's when warm. Great. i mean that's when i think you know the they kind of started up north the malls because it was just so cold you don't want to go shopping exactly. so you got mall of america up at north and all sorts of places. and that's a whole theme park all right, so that's the end of part one of my interview with Natalie. We actually got going and talking so much that uh, we're going to make a second part. So look for part two to air very soon. In the meantime, why don't you go to Natalie's website and find out more about Markets for Makers. Where can they go? You can find us at marketsformakers.com and also find us on Instagram, which is Markets for Makers. Perfect. So go ahead, check out Markets for Makers. Find out when they're coming into your area. And if you're a vendor, uh, there'll be information on there if you want to actually be a vendor at one of the events. We'll see you next on part two.